Well, I think it's the, to the honor of the Medical Hall of Fame to have Charles Griver. There's an expression in French that we reserve uh, for very few people when we say, c'est un grand homme. And grand incorporates all the facets of, of, of life, uh, both that life as an art and life as a science, um, in one person. Since the very beginning of his career, Charles Scriver has been a different kind of scientist with a different way of looking at things. I noticed that a lot of medicine, including what my parents did, was multiple questions across a day. In other words, what I can say is an inch deep but a mile wide type of interrogation of the problem. And I found I was interested in why does this person have this disease now and I wanted to go maybe an inch wide but a mile deep and I recognized somewhere along the line that that was allied to a research approach rather than a practice approach. He's an intellectual, not just a scientific intellectual. He reads everything. Uh, in fact, I think he had an undergraduate arts degree, I think it was in geography. So his mind is really uh, capable of understanding all kinds of areas and he uses those areas in his research. Early in his career, this interdisciplinary approach to research led Dr. Scriver to ask a question. Is all genetic disease really incurable? Well, I think what he has done is brought the research from the laboratory to the patient. Uh, based on investigations that he has performed, he has gone ahead and developed screening programs, uh, programs which enable us to prevent genetic disease, not just treat, but to prevent disease. I spent two years learning to do chromatography, which is an analytical technique that identifies particular individual chemicals in solution. And I recognized that you could use that tool as a screening mechanism to detect chemical individuality in the urine and blood of people. So I was already conditioned to think about tools that would screen and find problems. When I got back here at McGill, uh, there was a buzz around amongst the small community of us around the world that maybe you could do tests in the newborn to pick up these inborn errors of metabolism that affected children and if you got to them early enough you could initiate treatment and so forth. So with a colleague who came and joined us in 1963, Mrs. Carol Clow, we did the pilot study for Quebec that led to the introduction of the Quebec network of genetic medicine when Claude Leberge and I and others put together this program. And that was the idea that screening for medical intervention would allow early um, identification and, eff and the introduction of effective treatment. He's also quite an active political campaigner for what he thought uh, the communities wanted. He definitely did not lack nerve when it came to contacting government officials and telling them that their science was wrong or their, where they were heading in terms of cutting back or doing this or being afraid of something uh, uh, what was, was wrong or whatever. So I, he had no, no fear of, of, of you know, the hierarchy or the way that things are, the status quo. The government has only two things to work with, votes and money. Which is the vitamin D issue? Is it a voting issue? No. When it's only 500 kids a year, voters don't care. If you're one of those people and the child goes into hospital and, you have to, and the society is paying for the hospital and you turn it into hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, the government's immediately interested because we saved the money. And we were a humane society dealing with a problem that was remediable. Rickets and vitamin D, genetic screening, the Human Genome Project, Charles Scriver's work touches people around the world. But that's only to be expected from someone whose parents taught him that caring is the crucial part of medicine and that a doctor's responsibility is out there in the real world. People have commented on the fact that for 35 to 40 years I've worked seven days a week, day and night, and seem to enjoy it, and furthermore that my family tolerates it. <laughs> um, I think there was a defining moment in my life after living 31 years, having all the training, having been given a job at McGill, 
I was driving to Quebec with my wife and three children to write the accreditation exams in pediatrics. We were assaulted by a hit and run driver. We were in a Volkswagen Beetle. The car went out of control and fortunately instead of going into a ditch on the highway that was being built between Montreal and Quebec, we rolled over, dissipated the energy and passed between the oncoming cars in the opposite lane. At the height of this accident occurring, I called out and said to whoever was listening in the car, my wife and children, it's been great because I thought I was going to die. And there was this enormous moment of stillness, the stillness at the point that the, the still point of the turning world is what T.S. Eliot calls it. And I realized this was a visionary moment. And when it was over and I was still alive and our family was all alive, and our car was upside down and kids falling out of the broken back window and so forth, I realized that I'd been given another chance and I'd better use the rest of my life.